education and heavy equipment in my blood, if that makes sense. <laughs> Uh, and I, our company is headquartered in a city called Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Has anyone ever been to Edmonton? They're right there. Okay, well, lots of Edmontonians. You can see Oilers or Flames fans? I'm sure you're always. Um, and what my company does is we really challenge the, 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 the traditional paradigms of, of how people learn. And we do that by applying technology to it. And this has been coming for a long time, and I'm sure you guys have been exposed to some of it. So uh, as an old guy, um, how many people remember this event? How many people actually remember watching Apollo 11 um, land on the moon? Nobody? My dad? Nobody? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. um, you know, remember when um, John F. Kennedy announced that, that they would put a man on the moon and safely return him in that decade? That was just a preposterous statement. It, it was hard to believe that that could ever happen. But it was, and it, uh, and it, and it occurred. And uh, what's interesting about that is that your phone in your hand has about a 300 times more um, random access memory than that entire lunar module that they sent to the Earth, to the lunar body. Right. So that's the, that's the kind of progress that we're making in technology. Um, uh, I mean, I'm assuming most people remember when the internet and suddenly, why do you have encyclopedias in your house anymore? All of the world's information is networked at your disposal. That's, that would have been pretty hard to imagine, you know, not that long ago. And of course, smartphones at all. I left mine in the bar at the Paris Hotel just overnight, and it basically wiped out my life. Because <laughs> yeah. I'm going like, how do I even get in touch with them? Uh, I mean, I don't even know my wife's phone number. I'd be like, uh, that's how weird it is. Imagine what it would be like without your phone. Like, it, it, it's almost, it's such a part of your life now. Well, that's never going to change. It's always going to So that's called adaption. How do we adapt to the new realities? Um, so, I mean, like, if you remember that rotary phone, in the house, it wasn't a phone. It was the phone. It wasn't your phone. It was the phone. Where is it? it was usually in a room on a wall. And you, you, you uh, back in the prairies in Canada, they you sometimes had shared lines. You could listen to the neighbors on the next farm talking to their people. <laughs> um, so it's not as scary as we kind of make it out to be. And sometimes industries, heavy equipment being one of them, construction certainly, where we're a little slower to adopt, you know, it's, we stay with the traditional ways. You know, that may be something that we have to evaluate a little bit better. So one of the things that spook us about um, technology, and I just finished a really good book called 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. I recommend you read it. Um, but it talks about, for the first time in our human existence, algorithms, we are nothing more than a, a biological algorithm, miniature computers that process us. We just have to have a consciousness that enables us to actually be aware. Uh, computers don't have that. And the reason why we've been successful of, you know, haven't been invaded or anything like that, or the robots haven't taken over, is because the human brain has always been traditionally smarter and capable of managing information um, better than any kind of computer, but that's changing. And we're coming to a point where AI is going to take, is going to replace a lot of types of jobs. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm, uh, you know, AI now is capable of, like, if doctors using it for a diagnosis, it's rarely a doctor will do a diagnosis or commit to one now without uh, a second uh, run through or going through a database. Um, lawyers. I mean, we've been using databases for a while, but I mean, and I happen to be a lawyer as well. I mean, this is going to be a point in time where we're not flipping through documents anymore. <coughs> Computers are going to make the decision on whether or not that guy's guilty based on of all the preponderance of the evidence, and it won't be clouded by whether that judge thinks he looks shifty that day. Um, you know, which is kind of uh, sometimes I'm sure that happens. Um, so there is a point in time where we're going to have a very big revolution in a lot of things. And I'm actually uh, moderating the panel for automated vehicles tomorrow. Uh, and my company looks hard at that because there is certain technologies out there now. And I know there's a company that can actually retrofit existing earth moving equipment with basically a computer that you program and geofence it and you put in this grading and it, it can basically um, do the work without the operator. Yeah, um, that's coming. Uh, we're working on a very big project with the Canadian government right now, uh, just in the early stages, 
for platooning. And what that is, is a big long, you know, like a semi-truck, big semi-truck. Well, you'll now have a semi-truck with a driver in it. And all the, there might be one or two truck semis behind them without drivers. And they will just follow it. And that's how transportation of goods will be moved more efficiently. And we're preparing simulators to train people on how to do this platooning work with less carbon footprint by driving around the real trucks and we're going to be doing it in simulators. Um, so this stuff is coming. But what about all that other equipment? And there's lots of it. It isn't going to be taken over by the robots anytime soon. So what does that mean? It means we have to be making sure the people that put those bums on those seats are that those people are as equipped as well as they can be. Our company's model is everybody goes home safe at the end of the day, in a variation of ways of saying it. Uh, and we sincerely believe that because everybody's entitled to that. And there's ways of doing that now that are much more engaging and interesting and effective than they were when I was growing up. The traditional classroom environment where you learn your theoretical and getting onto the actual thing to take your turn to maybe do the practical parts. So I'm going to talk to you about first about virtual reality. So does anyone, anyone ever that hasn't actually experienced virtual reality before? So everybody in here has had that one of those headsets on at some capacity? Yeah. Okay. Good, because I can I, I, I swear, not even two or three years ago, most of this room would have said, no, I've never seen. Uh, so it's much, people are much more familiar with it. I mean, by the end of the day, virtual reality in its forms has been around for decades and the military and the aerospace industries have been using it to train pilots, etc. To uh, because it's such an engaging and immersive way to put somebody in a dangerous situation but not really putting them in harm's way. So we're not really inventing anything. This guy on the other hand did invent something. His name's Palmer Lucky. Anybody familiar with who he is? Okay, if you've got kids and they're thinking about going to university and they want to study something, you might want to take a badge out of this guy's book. This guy came up with the design for what's called the, um, the head-mounted display, which is that's the one that goes right over your head, so it's a head. And he raised, and he put out a, a Kickstarter funding event for $250,000, I think it was 2014. Uh, he managed to raise a million and a quarter dollars, and then 19 months later, he sold his company to Facebook for $2 billion. So that was a nice return of investment for anybody that got in on the Kickstarter, I did not. <laughs> And that was the revolution. So now there's a whole different kind of varieties. That's actually one of our simulators in the barn right there. Mm -hmm. um, and what VR does and gives you that capability to do is we can immerse you in a completely um, immersed environment where we control everything you see, everything you feel, uh, all your experiences. And then we can measure every single thing that you do while you're in there. We know where you're looking. We know if a machine is going that way, but you're looking that way, we're deducting points. You know, because we can measure all that. It's objective and it's always the same. These are the real powerful elements of virtual reality. Another one, which may become very germane in our world, is networking with people remotely. Because I can drop you in this place with a headset on and you can be sitting in your underwear in your living room and you can be engaging with all these people. Um, and it's likely you were here. You just have an avatar. Then you get to pick what your avatar looks like. <laughs> <laughs> Most of us wouldn't pick ourselves. <laughs> um, and uh, so that's a very powerful communication tool now. We're working with um, Dow Chemical um, between four locations in the world where their people can get together and do high risk training in a virtual facility that we created. They normally stick a bunch of people down into a giant one that they made themselves and it costs them millions of dollars to operate. Um, and they run water through the pipes and you can't really hurt yourself. But it's, you've got to get everyone to Houston, and they're a global company. Two, you got to hope everything's working that day. Three, you know, there's a bottleneck of how many people can do it. But with virtual reality, I can lock you in and, and you can have as many people as you want. Maybe they're taking a bespoke course right there in a dangerous situation with the sounds and the sights of everything. And the one we're doing with them is one of their isolation of energy um, uh, course, red tag courses that's very hard to teach because you've got to teach it right in the facility. So that's what they're working on, because they recognize for decentralized large companies like Dow, they see the world is going to, they need to be in touch with their people and getting on airplanes, as we now know, is uh, going to be the least, um, <coughs> I mean, it's always going to be in front of them. It's always going to spend time, drink beer, shake hands, that. And you know what, I hope that never goes away. 
but for the practical purposes of giant organizations that have very decentralized teams, being able to bring those people together like they would be together in virtual reality is going to be enormously powerful. So be watching that. And this stuff is not complicated. It's not expensive. Um, uh, you know, it's the price of everything like technology is always coming down. So that's the headset that this gets. So they, and they, then they're getting way better by the time. When we first, uh, we've been working with virtual reality now for almost five years. It really only came commercial about two and a half years ago. And then, you know, people did travel logs on them or lots of gamers and stuff. But now heavy industry and other industries when sort of for, for profit businesses, whether we, the experience isn't just about entertainment or just simple information flow, they're really moving to adopt this for a lot of the reasons I'll describe. So, I mean, again, here's, here's why we do this. Because everybody deserves to get home safely and we all learn differently. Um, this is just purpose and values, all good stuff. Bet you'll get the deck if you want to know the deck. Um, so how do you learn was the big question. So our simulators actually deliver actual outcomes. You can actually get certified on our simulator instead of on a real piece of equipment. That's never happened before. Because, the, and there's a lot of detractors to say, nah, you need to stick time on the real thing, otherwise. Well, I don't disagree with that necessarily. Um, I would like to know that the pilot that's flying me has at one point been in a plane and not just on the flight simulator. And I'm sure most people are, you know, operating equipment would feel the same way. But people learn differently. So back here, back in the old days, um, we learned in that classroom environment. That was very passive and it was prescriptive and people would, uh, you know, your teacher would talk to you and then we'd get quizzed. But you had a very difficult time understanding who was gaining these concepts and who wasn't. Uh, and that's why you did the kind of frequent tests and you find out the kid that needs to be left back and the one that maybe you have to be moved ahead. And then classrooms started to get a bit more interactive. And actually another uh, Alberta, Canada company called Smart Technologies built those smart interactive boards. So you could actually you know, engage with people in other countries on the internet and with, in real time, as well as have all kinds of interactive tools based onto a screen, but it's still a flat screen. Yeah. And then now technology is really revolutionizing how people learn. And I think the classrooms and how teachers teach is going to change dramatically in the next few years. I think there's going to be the school they use for collaborating, kids do need to socialize and be together, but a whole bunch of their work is going to be done in using leveraging technology. My 12-year-old daughter, like she, she does everything online. There's a portal that she logs into. Her teacher can be right here in real time. She needs it, you know. These are the kind of things that you couldn't even imagine that when I, I was a kid. And why is that, uh, why is VR so powerful when it comes to um, uh, creating conditions for people to practice in? Because science tells us that passive learning, when you read something, you retain about 10% of it. You hear something, it's about 20%. And then it's seeing, seeing and hearing, saying, right? But doing actively, 90% retention. Because it, when, you're, when you're fully immersed, you also, I mean, it, it should be all about technical, but it, it's called a flight flight mechanism. Like, this is, this is real. Like, you can remember certain defining moments of your life, probably when you were really scared. You remember that day. Why is that? Because that is now locked in that uh, random access memory or ROM in your brain. Because, and we can, rec we can re recreate that, but in a safe environment. We, there's people that um, have, they, they self ejected off our simulator and it was only four inches off the floor because they were afraid of heights and it was for a boom lift and they, 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 it was too real for them. So, I mean, that's always good to know before a guy goes, yeah, I think I could run one of those. Uh, good to know if he's afraid of heights. And practice, 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 practice. Well, now we can stick, a room like this could have 50 simulators in it and we could do a practical evaluation on everybody in here in 20 minutes and I'd be able to give you a report card on every aspect of your behaviors um, in order to be able to make sure that you can then fix any bad behaviors right on that very same simulator and raise your level of proficiency up higher than it could ever be judged by a, uh, you know, a trainer with a clipboard trying to assess your behaviors while you're working at height. And of course, you know, if you're on a simulator, that's not as daunting, but it's as real uh, when you tip something over, I assure you. So when we look at industry, um, uh, the other element of this too is there's a changing workforce here. There is a lot of people that are coming into the workforce that are very comfortable with all technologies and we need to reach them in a different way. One of our big union partners, um, the biggest challenge is recruitment people into skilled trades. 
but they say every time they have one of our simulators at a trade show booth or like a job fair, these guys love it because they won. They get, they see that the union's got a commitment to their health and safety, and it's technology that they embrace. They see that as a positive. Well, you know what? I could be a laser or a painter or something like that. I don't mind working out. Hey, this is cool. I've been trained. That is enormously successful because that new talent learns differently, and there's a lot of old talent that's retiring soon and taking those skills with them. And we don't have enough people to build all the bridges, and the automated machines aren't going to be building those bridges for us in the next decade. That's still going to be people that get on equipment, um, and, that, and that's just a fact of life. So again, it's just kind of talking about the baby boomers, Generation X, and the millennials, and they're that's <laughs> they're pretty comfortable with this kind of stuff. Uh, I think I was going to launch a video here, or am I? Yeah, at the bottom. On the machine up the top. Oh, on this. Yeah, on the laptop. I got you. Up on the laptop. I got it. Uh, no, like well, you know what else. <laughs> My laptop's not. Okay, and I was supposed to be able to watch And I'm going to come to augmented reality because that's really interesting too. I mean, if you're not as familiar with augmented reality, what it is, it's basically overlaying. All right, here's a little video on augmented reality. These days, we spend a lot of time looking at screens. Computers, smartphones, and televisions are a big part of our lives. They're how we get most of our news, use social media, watch movies, and more. Virtual reality and augmented reality are two technologies changing the way we use screens, creating new and exciting interactive experiences. Virtual reality, also known as VR, uses a headset with a built-in screen that displays a virtual environment for you to explore. These headsets use a technology called head tracking, which allows you to look around the environment by simply moving your head. Augmented reality, or AR, is a bit different. Instead of transporting you to a virtual world, it takes digital images and layers them on the real world around you. This is done through the use of either a clear visor or a smartphone. So with VR, you can explore a world full of dinosaurs. But with AR, you can see those dinosaurs moving through the world around you. Both of these technologies are growing at a rapid pace and being implemented in a variety of different ways. Surgeons are using VR to practice highly technical surgeries before operating. Businesses are using them to give consumers virtual tours of products and locations. There are even apps that can use your smartphone's camera to scan and translate a foreign language in real time. As they continue to grow, VR and AR have the potential to greatly change almost every industry. You'll want to keep an eye on them to see how they might soon affect your job and potentially your everyday life. Goodwill Community Foundation, creating opportunities for a better life. So just touching on that, on, on augmented reality, um, oops, did I that? Um, what's interesting about augmented reality, we actually um, experimented with this um, at the Mine Expo about five years ago, and it was really interesting. Uh, we worked with our partner, Scope AR, and we built a, a headset that would basically lead you through a simple task. So couldn't you imagine if you maybe had to do um, repair and maintenance, or routine repair and maintenance, rather than you're having to think back to all of what you learned in mechanic school, you could actually have a headset on that would overlay instruction based on what it would see. Um, you know, take the wrench, you know, to, to, to this pumpage, and it records everything too. So you get what they call it as just-in-time um, knowledge. Uh, but the other day, I locked myself out of my own hot tub and I had no ability to do it. My daughter, within seconds, had a YouTube video about how to get back into that hot tub. That's how just-in-time information. And augmented reality is very powerful for that, so keep an eye on that too. Because uh, anybody that's maintaining fleets uh, that uh, you know, on routine maintenance, being able to actually have those very simple tasks, being able to be uh, instructed in real time, is really powerful, particularly if that fleet is all over the world. And I know when we did some work with Halliburton, they're going, are you telling me that I don't have to fly a tech to Abu Dhabi? Yeah, I mean, the guy just puts a headset on, he'll know how to do it. Which is, um, so keep an eye on that. We're not as much into that arena, but it is one that we're definitely staring at too. So VR has definitely been around for a long time as it relates to um, airlines, industries, had their form of virtual reality. Um, but let's go back to the training again too. 
could you imagine, and uh, how many people here actually um, maintain a fleet, actually, or in that actual business? And how many of those fleets, um, do you staff the very people that um, go, that sit on that equipment and operate it? Mm -hmm. Right. So this is really interesting because one of the things that um, we learned on a giant project, um, uh, I won't tell you which one, but it was a giant one, they had 8,000 people on site, and the GC's concern was that he had no idea whether anybody, any of the subs actually knew how to operate the equipment. Lots of them had cards, lots of them said they knew how to, and what they were doing is reactively training people. They had people walking around the site, giant site, massive, and they would remediate them if they saw them do something dumb. I mean, and when the guy was telling me, it's like, you mean like if he dies, and then you're gonna fix him, <laughs> don't you wanna fix him in advance? He goes, yeah, but we don't know how. So we actually showed them what we have, of, of um, we call it a verification of competency, and it's like, well, it's like getting scanned at the airport. You, it's about 20 minutes, it takes you through a whole series of um, scenarios in that time that will test all the elements of general competency on that piece of equipment. And it gives you a scorecard, and it's based on three buckets. Um, we call it ESP, efficiency, safety, and proficiency. And for uh, efficiency, can that task be done better if you were able to um, manipulate the boom into position faster and then move on to the next spot? Does that save money? And I mean, you know, can you imagine if an operator could actually get the job done 10% faster? How does that reflect on the bottom line? But by the way, without compromising safety, and if anything, he's safer, because that's the S in that ESP. Uh, proficiency is how he behaves with the machine. Uh, how many people here have seen, I know we've, we've seen this, well, one of our partners is United Rentals, and that's their biggest expense, is the cost of maintaining um, equipment that comes back from rental. They don't want to charge their customer because he's a good customer. And that's because guys are slamming the cylinders, they're slewing it into walls, they're just abusing the equipment. This kind of training will basically prove that out of your behavior because it grades you on it. And if, you, if you're just, maybe you're a great operator, maybe you're really fast and maybe you're safe, but if you're really hard on the equipment, it will, it will reduce, uh, and you'll get charged for that on your test. And uh, what we're already finding is that equipment comes back in better shape which means the branch doesn't have to repair it, it's back on rent faster. And um, the repair and maintenance costs are down, and that is their biggest expense in their, uh, in their uh, business, is the cost of repair and maintenance. So it has these really powerful applications for heavy equipment, um, and because it's not threatening, guys don't mind getting on those things. Um, I had one experience at the ARA show two years ago. This fella, he was probably, had to be 350 pounds. And we had our loop simulator there, our mobile elevator work buckles, and he gets on that, and he's just slamming the cylinders, and his buddy's got his boss back in um, Hobart and stuff, on video, and like in the, the, out the plate from the quick or whatever it is, and watching this guy slamming the thing, and he's getting all these demerits, but he doesn't know it. And uh, finally he gets off, and he's failed, even though he's an operator that's been working these things for about 10 years. And he said, well, I was just goofing around. So the problem, of course, is, you know, how far? He said that there's one design flaw. He said, you know, when you're in a boom lift like that, you really should feel the basket sway from the weight of the occupant. I was like, uh, I don't know how many 350 pound occupants there. We didn't really plan for that, so we'll, we'll take it under advisement if we have, uh, for the heftier gentleman, uh, full motion on the uh, actual. Lift. But uh, he, he came back another day and we did it over again. It scored extremely high on areas that he wasn't that good at. So it does have these very powerful uh, effects. Um, one of the challenges with, um, and you probably have seen some other simulators around the site, uh, one of the challenges that it, it's had is the motion sickness, and it's called uh, simulator adaption syndrome. And what that is, it's your brain saying, what I'm seeing, my body's not feeling, or vice versa. And that's, that's really uncomfortable. It's actually worse than car sickness. We have all full motion actuators finely tuned so that you can't tell. If you slam into something, that thing rocks. We will give you the feeling that you're at 100 feet off the ground in a basket. If you're there, if you move the basket, <laughs> it's got latency. That's really powerful to overcome any of that because your brain has to absolutely believe you're where it is. Otherwise, it, um, you, know, you, you get that feeling. And effectively what it is, it's like your body's saying, we think you're hallucinating, 
Right. You probably ate some poison. Let's get that poison out of you any which way you can. And uh, we can all imagine what that is. <laughs> Data. Biggest one. I go back to that customer with that giant, that GC with that giant site. When he, we told them the kind of data that we capture, everyone's behavior, and we run that through machine learning, that we start to get an aggregate of that data, we can now be predictive of, do you know that this is the most common thing for people to do? And we can train people out of those behaviors. The data on this, on you knowing your workforce, on every single one of them having an objective report card, and how you can move, move them up the food chain as far as competency, all of that data is captured. That's hundreds of bits of data that we can now present to you in different forms where you can aggregate it. One company in, some, in the UK that uses our simulators, they're taking their London job sites and they're competing against each other for competency and the storekeeper and the, and the referee is the simulator. So every site, and then they're mapping that against incident rates. And then they're taking that information and going to their insurance companies and WCB and saying, my sites are healthier, it's safer, and I can prove that. And I now um, want you to, I want you to actually uh, uh, charge me less for my insurance premium. United Rentals is already exploring that to offer their customers, look, we'll sell you some training on a simulator, and in exchange for that, if all of your operators get to the standard, guess what we'll do? We'll cut down on the cost of insurance on the vehicle because we know these guys, at least today, are, can behave the way that we need them to behave on the after machine. So those are things that are real paybacks of a products like this that's way different than the subjective opinion of a, a you know, a practical evaluate at a value eater that's assessing something maybe months before. Uh, I think we went through augmented already. It's just some examples of augmented reality. Um, and I think I talked about verifying competency on some of the value I was just describing, certainly predictive behavior. Um, here's our shameless plug. Now you have to, I guess I've been shamelessly plugging my company somewhat uh, through this entire presentation. <laughs> but you're trapped here now. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to show you a little bit about one of our products here. I got to get your help again. This is all suspense. This is what Sinatra does, by the way. He, he waits, makes you wait. Every job site has its challenges. But no matter how difficult the challenge, every worker on those jobs deserves to get home safely. You hope for the best with the workers you have, but confirming competency on the job is sometimes more of a gamble than it needs to be. For years, the best training has been on the job. Learn while you go. The only problem is, on the job training is costly, and it introduces unnecessary risk to people and your bottom line. Introducing Serious Labs. Our immersive simulation-based technology provides workers with comprehensive training without ever putting people in danger or taking up time and space on your work site. From the inexperienced worker to the tried and true, our heavy machinery immersive simulation training is creating a stronger, more competent workforce. Worksite training can be complex, dangerous, and expensive. The virtual world is the perfect place to recreate it because we can put you in harm's way without putting you in harm's way. Mistakes on the job are less likely to happen because our physics-accurate realistic simulations take people through situations that prepare them to react and work with challenges as they come. We're here to prevent injuries. We want to help businesses eliminate downtime and unscheduled maintenance that comes with inexperience and bad habits. With Serious Labs, your workers gain valuable experience, and they're ready to work without ever affecting your bottom line. Serious Labs, getting workers home safely. So you saw one of our, uh, that's our, uh, one of our flagship products, is the mobile elevated work platform. That contains two different um, simulators, one for a scissor lift and one for a boom lift. So that one, that one uh, chassis, has actually two simulators on it. Um, if you're interested, um, we are in the festival hall and we are showcasing our, um, we, we joint venture with United Rentals to develop a counterbalance forklift as well as a rough terrain fork in virtual reality. Ooh, scares me. Scary. Really <laughs> it's spooky. Um, and we've also partnered with a company called Industrial Training International out of Washington State and they, um, they are 
probably an industry leader in crane training and rigging. And we've got now, I think, nine different crane, um, crane simulators too. Uh, so uh, obviously, we, you know, we're very interested in your guys' industry. And what's coming, we're kicking off the project this year, is a truck driver simulator that when they were tested by Transport Canada, our simulators, they said it was so real that we also want bus drivers and ambulance drivers and everybody to be able to get tested and certified on a simulator instead of the real thing. Because what they're trying to do is reduce that carbon footprint of having all of that driver's ed going on on our streets and let people get enough of the stick time or practice time on a simulator. Um, you know, why not, right? Air, you know, air pilots have been doing it. Pilots are required to get on the simulators for a certain number of hours. Um, and they're measured one to one with actual flight time. Oh. <laughs> so in, in my day, we've won a variety of different awards we're very proud of. Um, we partnered with the um, International Power Access Federation. Um, they represent about 80% of the market, um, OEMs, um, GCs, um, uh, as far as the aerial equipment. Uh, and we're now certified on their products as well, uh, their, uh, through their course fair. We're also in the process of applying for ISO and ANSI so that you can get trained um, on a simulator and it's predictive of if you exactly train on uh, an actual piece of equipment and the measurements are like 98% of, of transferability. Um, so that's, there's more and more stuff in there. Oh, this is a fun one, you like this. This is another application, but if you see here, this is an airline scenario, and if you visit our booth, we have a video of it up now. We created a module right in the simulation because the airline industry said, yeah, that's all good if you're going up a flat wall, you know, on a rough terrain construction site, but here's our problem in the airline industry. We don't use those giant um, scaffolding, remember the old days, they just close the scaffolding around the plane? They don't do that anymore. They only use aerial equipment, like boomless and scissorless. Well, what's the problem with that? We got a guy changing the tail light and he's coming at it with a giant boom lift. You touch that fuselage and it now has to get retested, wind sheeted, everything. It costs millions. And so their problem isn't so much about just pure safety, it's about the damage that can be done from an, an operator that is not confident on that aerial equipment. And uh, we're now being tested with seven major airlines. And that was just added right to the MOOP simulator itself. Uh, same thing with, um, uh, we're working with Tennessee Valley Authority and a couple of the big power companies in Canada that want us to create a bespoke substation module. So you can teach guys to be very specific in the kind of job and work they'd be doing on the equipment well before they ever have to get on the equipment. And that's not hard for us to do. I mean, it's, it's, it, you know, it takes time and resources, but uh, those are the kind of things that you can layer on. Not everyone's on a construction site. So we're, you know, we're making, we're applying these learnings to all kinds of different types of equipment, and we're obviously going to be very interested um, to know what kind of equipment do equipment management professionals believe would be best to simulate it for the reasons that I've described today. Uh, there's our universal motion base. What's cool about this? It kind of looks like a DeLorean, uh, mm -hmm. but it doesn't go in the future. Those pods on the side of the pedals, they're all detractable. So it's, if Monday is your training, um, you know, counterbalance forklift, put on that unit. Next day it might be, oh, well, today is a, a telehandler, and that's, uh, that's the training for that day. And then you might have a loop simulator, it might be forklift, it might be whatever you want that day. If you're seated, it'll go onto that. So all the cranes will go onto the same one. So you don't have to buy it over and over again. You can buy all those bases. So that's, a, that's our universal uh, motion phase. Um, I've talked for a long time now, so I'm more than delighted to, to invite some questions. Uh, and I'll just repeat, you just yell them out, and I'll just repeat it back in case nobody could hear. So, uh, any questions over here? In terms of, especially folks in our industry, acceptance from a generational standpoint, um, I would imagine younger people perform better on a virtual reality. Um, you have a great question. So it's the question is, is, is it people that are you know, deploying these, are they focused on just the younger generation or is this about upscaling all operators? And it's a combination of both. Because what happened was, and this is where a lot of, like, I mean, I remember United Rentals is really worried about it, and a lot of the GCs is that these good operators are leaving their jobs and they're taking all that with them. 
So even to create the curriculum of being able to translate it into true learning objectives and what are the things you want to test on this equipment, we had to scoop it out of their brains before they you know, went off to the beach uh, for forever. And, but, and certainly what's replacing that um, workforce is younger. But as far as who does better on it, or, um, or if young and old, like honestly, we've had so many senior guys who were poo-pooed like, like you can't, forget it, you're not. And I'm literally, they, and they've done it, you know, they've done it to my face. And we just, well, just, just try it, just try it. And not once has that ever been, that was amazing. I thought I was there. I really thought that I was, you know, and then he sees his scorecard and all the things that he did wrong, like not looking when he's going in one direction, you know, slamming the cylinders, not dropping the secondary boom or whatever it might be. Um, it, we were thrilled with the adoption once people tried it. And I'll give you one last example of that at the International Power Access Federation. We were over in London and meeting with them and we had our simulator there. Uh, and they're like, yeah, I we get it, it's cool. But you know what, traditional training, it's not gonna change. Maybe it's an and, maybe it's something to help, but it ain't gonna replace. So they said, we'll, tell, we'll show you what real training is. So they took our guy, our sales guy, and said, we're gonna put you through the whole course. And you spend about five hours in the classroom learning stuff on a PowerPoint and the guy telling war stories. Then you get out in the yard and you get your 15 minutes of navigating around a couple of pylons, putting the boom up and stuff like that. You know, and it's pretty complex. You gotta do things in the right order and you gotta always be. Uh, and it's a very comprehensive test. The guy's watching for all of your little indicators. Our guy, when, when he was seated there, the, the, the question was, it was written, he was like, oh, has anyone ever been on one of these before? And my guy went, nope, I haven't. Oh, well, don't worry, we'll give you a little bit extra time to practice before your test of health that. He said, no, I don't want it. I just don't want it. He said, well, have you ever had any experience? He says, no, just demoing our simulator, but I think that should be good enough. And he did it. And he was in a room with people that were recertifying. These are people that already had cards and, and let them expire and they had to get them renewed. And so they're, they're, they're seasoned operators. He scored 100%. He had zero demerits. They could not find one fault in his behavior. They phoned the president of IPATH that day. And the very simulator that I brought over there, I let them have it for a year. And they traveled all around the world and met with all of their members globally. And they said, this is the future. And now we're built, we're built right into their strategic plan. And those were old guys. <laughs> yeah, they, they, were, they were the real resistance. Um, anyone else? Oh, this gentleman right here. What's the largest crane? Ah, gee, I knew you were going to ask me something like that. I thought you were a lawyer, not a crane officer. Uh, well, we're definitely, we're, I think we have a tower crane in production right now. Um, the Lee Bear is actually on our site as we speak with our, because um, uh, we built the heavy crawler crane. Um, it's really neat. And I guess, I guess, what's the biggest crane? I mean, I mean what is the biggest crane? Is that a tower crane? Is that probably the biggest one? Yeah, it's awesome, yeah. So I mean, there's nine of them, and now you have to come to, the, come to our website to check it out, but you'd be able to see. But um, for us, uh, it was really interesting working with the OEMs because they gave us everything we needed. You know, all the load calculations and stuff, we built that right in. So your experience in the cab is just like if you're in the real thing. And where it's interesting is where that may lead, and I don't know, but I suspect it may, is that for crane operators where a giant lift would be done in, you know, maybe every couple hours. Well, then he just moves there, and now he's doing a lift in Denver, and now he's doing a lift in, you know, China, you know, from that one, from that chassis. Because everything that he is feeling is so responsive um, uh, that it would just be like he was lifting in that real environment. You know, health cameras are keep things up. That is where I've seen the industry suggest that they want to go. We'll, we'll have to wait and see. <laughs> so are you working through OEMs, is that? Uh, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, we are and we are it. So that, that uh, boom scissor lift, that's a, that's a Skyjack control panel for the scissor, and it's a Genie Z45 for the boom. But at the end of the day, we're not trying to teach you to drive a Chevy, we're trying to teach you good practices. We're trying to, trying to teach you to drive a car with all of the safe half that tra attributes. Now, what we do though, is we invite OEMs, and we've talked to lots of them here, that go like, well, I like my machine in the game, like in the environment, so that they see my stuff and I want the chassis to have my control panel. Uh, he said, sure, you will, will build anything you pay us to build. <laughs> and if that means more people will rent your stuff or buy your stuff because it comes with a simulator to learn how to run it, fill your boots. And so that, we've had a lot of attention for that, <laughs> um, which we, we think we'll see a lot more of that too.
What does it cost to build uh, a sim? Uh, what does it cost to build as far as the actual no, hardware? No, no, the simulated um, environment. Yeah, so it really just depends on the complexity mm -hmm. and the number of scenarios. So for our boom and scissor, they each have 16 scenarios each. So there's 32 different activities, right up to loading the track, to getting manipulating into height, getting in position. Really complex ones, like I could never pass. So that particular one, I think the scissor lift took us over a year. So, I mean, it all time and resources, so if you based it on, you know, I got a lot of big bang, big, big bang theory type people in my office. There's lots of them, if you ever watched that show, I got 75 of them. Um, and those Oompa Loompas can do anything if you just let them and you try to keep them between the ditches. So I'd say, I can't really reveal what it would actually cost, but, um, you know, we tend to look to partners. What we do is we don't just build it and make it exist. We build it and then we have a revenue share in the back end because we want to keep this thing always updated. What happens if the regulations change? What happens if the technology of the hardware just um, updates? Like those headsets updated um, last year and we replaced every single one and every unit that we had ever sold because uh, that's our brand promise. So um, depending on what the, um, you know, the complexity of it, how much the learning objectives, um, you know, it's probably be a, six months to a year's work and then it's math is runs from there. And sorry, sir. Oh, sorry, should I'll take this gentleman first? Is your company doing any work towards the maintenance repair side of the We're not, but that's a great question because what, one of the things, in order for us to get um, certain um, certifications, there needed to be a walk around component. So you had to be able to go and do a visual inspection of a machine. And you had to, you know, and it knows where you're looking and it knows that you're looking at the right things. And we also had to have an emergency descent feature. So if you were trapped at night, you had to do so. Um, but as far as augmented, you know, we, I was mentioning, we've we done something like that at Mine Expo a few years ago. One of the challenges there is that the, um, you have, it's all done by QR code. So in the repair and maintenance, the, the, the cameras really need to know what it's looking at. You know, because three years ago, a tree and a person, the, the, the camera can know. That's why virtual reality is so much better, because I control everything in that world. But the virtual augmented reality is it's saying, I think that's a thing, and if it is, you should treat it like that. I go, that's a men's washroom, that's a telephone pole, that is. Now with the internet of things, IoT, where everything has almost like a digital badge, those cameras can now go, I know what everything is, because it's telling me what it is, and all the information about it. And QR codes are getting phased out. We see a real future in that for those very reasons where maintenance can be done right just in time, certainly routine maintenance. So we're not um, aggressively doing it right now. We're kind of a little too busy in our own arena. But uh, yeah, watch that space for sure. I think for particularly for people that are maintaining fleets, it's going to be huge. And so you yeah, have to go ahead. Yeah. What would be, what would be a, a low cost Um, are you just adding like, some sort of VR? Uh, what kind of training were you thinking about? Well, you know, I mean, we do training. We do all the training, so you know, we just have to train for the Sure. Changing the world, filtering the cap. Yeah, okay, no, so a good example. There's a lot of companies out there now that are working in VR and doing very bespoke specific things. We've stuck mostly in um, facilities maintenance, big projects stuff, and equipment, but um, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. <laughs> oh, that's funny that you mentioned that because that's exactly what we're doing with the uh, Department of, well, it's called the uh, uh, Transport Canada and the uh, Alberta, um, Alberta Motor, Vehicle, Tra Motor Transportation Association, that big truck project we're doing. It maps to the highest standard of both Canada, the US, and Mexico, and the EU. So when that simulator comes out, you will have a defensible driver's training simulator at your disposal if you choose to get one. Because we're doing that right now. Uh, so when it comes to more just very specific stuff, it's, um, it can get pretty pricey, and, um, you know, because you want to create the, some guys will do that stuff. Just If you're really just trying to get something simple across, you know, it doesn't cost that much because you know, gamers are making those environments all the time. You just steal them, kind of like a cat, and say, all right, we just need to meet in the classroom, 
this is a classroom, they put their headset on from home and now we're in a classroom. It's when you get into things where now there's physics involved, like you're interacting with something inside that environment, then it starts to cost money because now you need actuators and you need, that thing needs to respond because it's not really there. So uh, I, I'd be loath to put a price tag on what that would be, but do a little due diligence and I think you'll find that there's guys out there that if you're trying to just do something pretty straightforward, like changing an oil filter on a truck, um, the question banks is, is that something better suited for augmented reality, i.e. just-in-time instruction? You are now looking at the filter. Take off the old filter by doing this, and that's literally what they do. And then take the new one and put the seal on, and that's why you change the oil filter. Good job. Uh, they're, they're made by um, right. yeah. uh, I'm going to lie and say they're Canadian trucks, so it's different. It's an all in metric. Why? Um, and that would probably be a more appropriate utility, would be that just in time knowledge using augmented reality. Now, augmented reality could really change a trade show like this. Because mm -hmm. with augmented reality, by putting on a set of glasses, you could project that giant caterpillar truck and have everybody walk around it and see it without it actually being there. Imagine that. I mean, you imagine what it costs to have the real oh, thing there. You know, yes. like those things trundle up and down the highways of uh, Alberta all the time going up to the oil sands. It's, 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 it's staggering how big they are. That could change how we do all these things. Can you imagine being in, a, in an environment with, like where that, in a room like this, you could project any type of equipment. We could just walk around to, you want, where do you want to see the scissor lift now? Okay, boom. And then now everybody with the glasses on can see that same scissor lift with you going like, see that? And this is why this feature is now, let me operate it for you, everyone can stand by and look at that. So that could really change how we gather to look at big things like that. Um, I think there's better work to be done, but I know a lot of the OEMs are building, uh, primarily for their sales guys, is building virtual um, uh, or projectable uh, augmented reality images of all their stuff. And that's really easy to do like those. Uh, Google, not Google Glass tried it, but I think that the new one from Microsoft, um, HoloLens, like there's, there's, I've tried those, it's really good. And you put one in the store and suddenly there's like animals walking by, you know, a tiger over there. Yeah, I did too much acid back in the day. Uh, no, I didn't, there's never no acid. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's these alternatives that what we're doing is gonna change how we interact with each other, how we show things, how we maintain things, how we commit to the new generation of workers and make sure they're getting home safely. Um, all of those things are in play, but don't be afraid of this. I mean, what this last couple of weeks has taught us and it has accelerated uh, acutely since we've been on the ground here is that the world can change in an instant. And you know, with the NBA, the NF, or the NBA uh, is shut down, so is the NHL, so is MLB. I mean, they're just they're just saying, hey. You know, we were talking, what does that do to everybody that works at that stadium? What about that giant new stadium for the Raiders over there? What happens if this is the new reality of you're watching sports with a headset yes. from your living room? Because that's where it's safe. You know, you don't want to be in a giant arena with a bunch of other people because I can ex I can create that experience for you very vividly from any angle, best seats in the house, mm -hmm. right on the floor. And you can be, you know, sitting there in your underwear eating skip the dishes uh, you know, uh, uh, without ever having put you and your family at home's way. So it, it, this is coming, you know, this well, it's here. Mm -hmm. you know, the last time I gave this speech a couple years ago to the AMP, it was coming, but now it's arrived. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yes, over here. Yeah, so your example for augmented reality, well, you know, having a, a machine be able to walk around. So how do you physically, you got to have a, a 3D point cloud of that machine or? Yeah, it's like, yeah. It's pretty so tiny. Is it augmented reality, isn't it? real-time thing and so in your example a little bit more of a virtual reality you got to have that 3d point cloud ahead of time or so what um so great question and i'm not very technical so i'll probably be blunt with this but certainly in virtual reality i could stick a headset on you and i could create any condition for you to walk around in, and you could actually drive the vehicle right. so vr gives you sorry that was just kind of was the, the question was you know is, is this a point cloud that you know you have to have the you know the the very uh, spots where you're going to be looking predetermined, or can it just be projected? So right. augmented reality is basically just imagine yourself with the, with the glasses on, they're clear, and you see everything you see, but you flick on the light, <laughs> and now the thing you, you want to appear in that space will appear. And then it knows if you're walking around it. So if you project that truck in this room, you don't know when I get to this side of it, and it'll show me what that side should show all, through the lens. 
uh, and, and that's, you know, that'll see past it at that level. Um, so it's, it's very capable. And, you know, we get asked this all the time. As a matter of fact, I was supposed to be speaking at a big event in um, Dubai next month, but uh, for the uh, Expo 2020 on applying some of these new technologies. They want everything planned in advance and seen in advance. Like they want, nobody wants to look at architects' drawings anymore. Nobody wants to look, they want to see the real thing. They want to walk through the house before they decide to put the kitchen there and the bathroom there. Like this is what people are demanding now, so the world. And CADs, all of these, um, especially when it comes to just the, you know, the geo, the, the, the images themselves, like that's, to make it really good. Like you should see this, uh, this facility that we did for Bao. I mean, it, you can even see the way the light reflects, reflects because of the dust in the air. It's not real. You're, you're there. You're there. You're in. Um, you can do the, all of those things. They're used over again. There are as many times as you want. That's the beauty of virtual reality or even augmented reality. It's all those things that you create. You can use over and over again. People can be using them simultaneously. Uh, so, and it's not that complicated. It's just you know shapes and you know painting it. Because <laughs> remember, you don't have to actually build the engine. You just have to. The impression that the engine under the hood. Uh, anybody else? Yes. Uh, can you uh, today? Can you simulate like environmental impacts? Let's say it's raining outside, it's freezing outside, anything like that. We can. You know, we. It's a great question. I get asked it a lot. We uh, have elected to. Um, you know, at the end of the day, and we've been, we talked a lot of experts about this too. They, you can, like certainly the, the cranes, we can adjust wind. So, because that's a very important part of the mm -hmm. operation of that crane is what the weather is actually doing. Um, you know, rain is basically you have to take somebody with a hose <laughs> if you're on the outside basket, but that, how to create that impression, but certainly wind and any of those things we can replicate. The only challenge is, the question is, if you're testing somebody, the, te the test environment needs to be consistent. Uh, so you can practice in different environments, but uh, the test environment has to be consistent and usually it's good weather. So there's some kind of yeah, absolutely. That's a, uh, because we use actuators. They're built by D box. They're the ones that do it for the theaters. You know, when you're watching the movie and you don't send your chair does that. Um, those are very finely tuned. We've got a whole department that does nothing just to do what you just said. That haptic feedback is critical because if you put a throttle forward and the machine doesn't respond the way it would in the real world, it takes you right out of that experience. And then you're not learning anymore. You're back in passive country. You need to be actively engaged. You need to believe you're at height or in a in a mine or whatever it is. So it's a great question. It's probably one of the things that we focus most of our R and D on is to make sure that's perfect. And, and our partners, Deepbox, has been they've been very good, but didn't even realize that this could be an application. We created a whole division for them now of industrial equipment innovators and not just leather chairs and theaters. So um, yeah, that's something very important. Haptic feedback is critical. All right. Well, uh, thanks very much for having me. I hope this was useful. I'm pretty sure this presentation will be available. Um,